Hey everyone, welcome back to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I hope you guys are doing super, super well. So welcome to episode 36. Today, we're gonna be talking about a case that is truly frightening and I feel like it's something that a lot of people actually do worry about and fear. When I first heard about the application Uber, which if you're not familiar with, it's kind of like a taxi, except you can call it directly from your phone. You can like see it on an application. You can ride share, you can see the driver's information, you know, their license plate, how many rides they've given, their reviews, everything. So it's supposed to be kind of a safer and more convenient way to get transportation. You can even share your ride status with your friends and family as you're in the Uber so that people know when you got in, where you are, and when you get dropped off safely. But when I first heard about Ubers, I was truly frightened about it. I mean, I never really liked to take taxis before. I actually take a lot of taxis when I go to Mexico and it's still very scary. So I'm just not a fan of taxis or Ubers. You know, just the thought of getting into a stranger's car and trusting them to take take you to where you need to go is frightening. Bad people can take advantage of this and that's exactly what happened in today's case. Today, we're gonna be talking about what happened to Samantha Josephson and how she was murdered after getting into the wrong Uber. There's so much information to go over, so with that, let's jump right in and let's talk about what happened to Samantha. Samantha Josephson was born on August 13th, 1997 in Robbinsville, New Jersey to her parents, Seymour and Marcy. She had an older sister named Sydney who was a year and a half older than her and they were really close. Friends and family described Samantha as being very bubbly, social, and also a little bit clumsy. She was also absolutely stunning. You know, she had this big, bright smile and she was just someone that was, again, so beautiful on the outside and on the inside. There's not much that we do know about Samantha's early life, but we do know that she did really enjoy playing soccer and basketball and that she was very social with her friends and again, just very close with her family. When Samantha was in high school, she was pretty much already thinking about what she was going to do after, you know, what university she was going to attend, what career she was going to have and what she was going to do with her life. During this time, she was touring a lot of universities and she was really set on attending the University of South Carolina. There was just something about that university that really grabbed Samantha's attention. She knew that that's where she wanted to go and that's actually the only school that she applied to. So she was pretty much putting all her eggs in one basket. I feel like it's really risky to do that, you know, to only apply to one university, but Samantha made this decision and it was a risky decision, but in the end, the risk was worth it. Samantha was accepted to the University of South Carolina and she was just so happy about this. She was ready, you know, she was ready to go to the university. She was ready to start this new chapter of her life and just get her life going. Her family was a little bit worried about her going to this university. I mean, you know, they were from a small town, so they were worried about her moving away, being on her own, you know, moving to a different place. But Samantha was just so happy about this. In 2015, she graduated from high school and then she moved to Columbia, South Carolina and began her semester at the university of South Carolina as a political science major. She was honestly having a blast at the university. She was meeting so many new people. She was enjoying her classes and she even joined a sorority. So she was definitely very busy during this time, but she still kept a very close relationship with her family. Her mom would text her good morning every single day. Samantha would always respond and she just always made sure to never lose that communication with her family. As for Samantha's love life, in the spring of 2017, she met a man named Greg. The two of them just immediately clicked and they started dating. During this time, she was balancing schoolwork, a relationship, and also a job. She was working as a waitress at a restaurant called the Liberty Tap Room. So Samantha was a busy girl, but Samantha loved every moment of this. She was able to experience so much during this time with the university. She was actually able to study abroad, so she spent a semester in Barcelona, Paris, and Madrid, which I feel like is such a cool experience, you know, to study abroad and just do something crazy while you're in college is so fun. I definitely wish I would have done that, and I'm just so happy that Samantha was able to experience this wonderful journey. During her senior year at the university, she lived in an apartment building called The Hub with some roommates. Now, Greg had actually graduated early in December of 2018, so he moved back to live with his parents in Charleston, so he no longer lived near Samantha. They lived about two hours away from each other now, but he would often go back to the university to visit Samantha, and, you know, she would go visit him, so their relationship was very much still a thing during this time. Despite them no longer living near each other, you know, they were very much in love. She was set to graduate in May of 2019 with her degree in political science, 
and then afterwards she planned on studying law at Drexel University. She actually had gotten a full ride scholarship to the university, which is amazing. And her boyfriend Greg was actually planning on moving there with her. So everything just seemed to be falling in place, but unfortunately, Samantha never got the opportunity to graduate or attend law school because on Thursday, March 28th, 2019, Samantha was murdered. That day was a Thursday. 21-year-old Samantha and her friends decided to go out that night to celebrate the fact that Samantha had gotten into law school. This was such a big deal. I mean, Samantha had been working so hard towards this. So the fact that she got into law school and also received a scholarship for it was such a big deal. So of course, this needed to be celebrated. On top of that, the school year was almost over. So everyone was just really happy at this point and they just wanted to go out and have some fun. No one had classes on Fridays, so this Thursday was pretty much to start to their weekend. Samantha did invite Greg to come out with them, but he didn't really want to make the drive that day because again, they lived two hours away from each other and they already had plans for Samantha to go come visit him in two days. So Greg decided to stay home for the night, but you know, he told Samantha to go out, to go have fun, celebrate her friends and just go live her life that night. Samantha and her friends went to their friend Edgar's house first to meet up. And then from there, they all walked to this area called Five Points, which which is an area with bars just off campus. It's kind of like the hangout spot for the town, so they all got there at around 12.30 in the morning. They started making line for a bar called Bird Dog, and then they were able to get in at about 12.40 in the morning. Everyone says that Samantha was having a really good time. You know, she was happy, she was celebrating with her friends, she was having some drinks. Everything was going well throughout the night. Samantha was texting Greg with updates as to what they were doing, and she just seemed really happy. At around two in the morning, Samantha decided that it was time for her to leave. Now, she didn't tell her friends that she was leaving. She didn't even say goodbye to them. She just walked outside the bar all by herself. While she didn't tell her friends that she was leaving, she did tell Greg. She actually called him and told him that she was going to get into an Uber and then go home. I'm not sure why she didn't tell her friends that she was leaving. It could be that maybe the bar was just really rowdy. You know, maybe she couldn't really hear her friends or they couldn't really hear her. Or maybe it just wasn't a thing. You know, maybe everyone just kind of left and did their own thing without letting each other know about when they were leaving. So I'm not really sure, but I do just want to kind of emphasize to people that it's definitely important to tell your friends where you're going, especially if you're out with them at a bar or at a club or even at a restaurant. It's so important to keep them updated as to if you're going to the bathroom, when you're coming back from the bathroom, if you're going up to the bar by yourself to get a drink, if you're getting into an Uber by yourself. Of course, I'm not blaming Samantha for anything, but I do just want people to know that it's so important to notify people about where you're going, especially in that type of setting. Also, all the friends had each other's location on Find My Friend, so maybe Samantha just figured that they would check her location and see that she was on her way home. So Samantha tells Greg on the phone that she's going to get inside the Uber and go home. She hangs up with him and then she stands on the corner of the street waiting for the uber to pick her up about 12 minutes later a black chevy impala pulls up and samantha gets inside while samantha is on her way home greg is checking up on her just to make sure that everything's going well and just to make sure that she gets home safely so he's keeping tabs on her location through the find my friends app and he starts to get concerned because he's watching her location and he can see that samantha was going south which doesn't really make sense because Samantha lives north of the bar. So why was she going in the completely opposite direction? He tried to call Samantha to ask her if everything was okay because he thought that maybe the Uber driver was just going the wrong way or that something was happening. But Samantha wasn't answering the phone. He then started to text her, but again, he received no response. What's odd is that Samantha didn't hit decline on the calls and she didn't even open the text messages because she actually had her red receipts on. So Greg would have been able to tell that Samantha had read the messages if she had opened up her phone. So Greg keeps looking at Samantha's location. I mean, he's definitely concerned because she's going in the opposite direction. She isn't answering her phone and she isn't answering his text messages. So in his mind, he's thinking, what is going on? At around 2.30 in the morning, Samantha's location now shows that she is on Montgomery Avenue, which is about three miles south of the bar. And that is when her location just stopped updating. 
So no matter how many times Greg or anyone would try to refresh her location, it would just keep saying that it was last updated at 2.30 in the morning and that she was on Montgomery Avenue. Now, this usually happens because either someone turned off your phone or your battery just died. Now, since Greg was not able to get a hold of Samantha, he decided to call her roommates to let them know that this was happening, that her last known location was somewhere very random and that she wasn't answering the phone. So the friends decide to also go on the Find My Friends app just to see if maybe they could get an update location, but it also showed the same thing that Greg was seeing. Her friends decide to get in the car and actually drive towards Montgomery Avenue to see if they can find Samantha. So her friends were on it. You know, they just really wanted to see if everything was okay. So they end up pulling up to Montgomery Avenue and that's when they see that there really wasn't much there. There was just kind of like an abandoned looking house. It looked like an old sorority house. There were some cars parked out front, but there was just no sign of Samantha. Since there was no sign of Samantha being there, the friends and Greg just figured that maybe Samantha had left her phone in the Uber that her phone had died and that's why her location wasn't updating. So they truly just thought that Samantha was already back home safely, that everything was okay, and that unfortunately she had just left her phone behind. With that idea in his head, Greg decided to go to bed. The friends also continued on with their night and they ended up going to another friend's house to continue hanging out. Her roommates didn't get home until about five o'clock in the morning. And when they walked into their apartment, they saw that Samantha's bedroom door was wide open and that she wasn't inside her room. In fact, she wasn't anywhere in the apartment. She wasn't in the bathroom, in the kitchen, in the living room, nowhere. Now, this didn't really raise that big of a red flag for the roommates. They were concerned that she wasn't home, but they just thought that maybe Samantha had gone to sleep at another friend's house and that she just didn't notify anybody about what she was doing. So again, they just thought that everything was okay and the roommates decided to go to bed. Now, let's take a break to thank our sponsors who make the podcast possible. As you guys might know, I'm a bit of a weather wimp since I do live in Southern California. So when it comes to winter travel, I need bags that can fit a lot. Whether I'm throwing an extra layer in my work tote or packing three parkas in my carry-on roller, I rely on Base to keep me looking cool but also feeling warm. Base was created by actress Shay Mitchell to make sleek and affordable bags, luggage, and accessories accessories designed to help you travel effortlessly while still looking fashionable. Base has been thoroughly made by a team who knows everything you would want in a perfect piece of luggage. 360 degree gliding wheels, a cushioned handle, built-in weight indicator, washable bags for your dirty clothes, and all the interior pockets you need to keep you organized. Their luggage comes in multiple sizes and colors and for shorter trips. The weekender bag is super functional and even has a place to store your shoes separately. And you don't even have to worry about a base bag and cargo or overhead. They are built to withstand travel and look cute at the same time. Till date, they've gotten over 30,000 five-star reviews. So whether you're packing for a quick trip or looking to breeze through the security line, Base has your personal items covered. I love Base. I'm not even kidding you when I say that I recommend them to everyone. My dad has a Base luggage. My sisters have the Weekender. My mom has a work tote. We are simply a Base family and I love it. Right now, Base is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting basetravel.com slash what happened. Go to basetravel.com slash what happened for 15% off your first purchase. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash what happened. And now let's get back to the case. They all wake up the next morning at around 10 30 in the morning and that's when they see that Samantha is still not at the apartment and that her work shoes were still there. Which is very odd because she actually had a shift that morning so why were her shoes still here? One of the roommates decide to call the restaurant to see if maybe Samantha had gone to work and had just left her shoes behind. But that's when the restaurant told them that Samantha had not shown up for her shift and that she hadn't even called to let them know that she was going to be late or that she wasn't going to make it at all. At this point, the roommates are now starting to think that something bad has happened to Samantha. There's no way that she would miss work without letting anybody know about why she was missing or about where she was. This is when they all decided to go out and start looking for Samantha. At this point, they didn't report her as missing because they honestly thought that they had to wait like 48 hours, 72 hours to report her as missing. So they just decided to kind of just start looking for her themselves. They go back to where her last location was showing, which was Montgomery Avenue. And again, they don't find anything. 
They start calling jails to see if maybe Samantha accidentally got arrested. They call hospitals, but there was just no sign of her. Meanwhile, Greg is starting to wake up and he opens up his phone and sees that he hasn't received any updated messages about Samantha. She hasn't called him to let him know that everything's okay. She hasn't texted him, nothing. So he calls her roommates to let them know that he hasn't spoken to her yet. And that's when the roommates tell him, you know, she also didn't show up at the apartment and she also didn't show up to work. Greg just knew that something was incredibly wrong so he actually got into his car and started making the two-hour journey back to campus while he was in the car he actually called samantha's parents to let them know about what was happening and about samantha's disappearance her mom said that she did notice that that morning samantha hadn't replied to her good morning message that she would send every single day but she wasn't really too concerned about it but now hearing the rest of the story she was really scared and the parents also decided to get in the car and start driving all the way from new jersey to the university which is about an 11 hour drive at about 12 30 in the afternoon the roommates decide to finally call 911 and report samantha as missing this is that 911 call yeah it's really hard 911 what's your emergency hi um we were just gonna call to let you know our friend is missing all right so you want to make a um, uh, missing person report yeah, it hasn't been like 24 hours or anything, but if we could go ahead and do that, like that'd be really nice. Yeah, it don't have to be 24 hours if we report anybody missing. Oh, I don't know why I thought that. Oh, no. Okay, yeah. Um, what's the address? Where, where are you located? Um, 1426 Main Street. Is he missing from his address? We went out in Five Points last night, and she still hasn't made it home. Her phone's dead. Um, we don't think she, like, went home with, like, a guy or anything. Like, we're, like, actually, like, worried. So, she missed work this morning. All right. What, what is your apartment number? 901. All right, what is her name? Samantha Josephson. She goes by Sammy. Samantha, what's her last name? Josephson. J-O-S-E-P-H-S-O-N. And how old is she? 21. She white, black, Hispanic? She's white with really dark hair. She's Jewish. Do you know her, um, do you know her date of birth? Um, August, someday in August, August 13th. And what's the year? I guess 1997 would make her, yeah, 1997. Okay, but how tall do you think she is? Probably like five, six, maybe close to five, seven. Uh, how much do you weigh? Um, probably like 145, 150. And you remember what she was wearing? She was wearing a bright orange shirt with black pants. So we had a bright orange shirt and black pants? Yes. And how was her hair? Um, it was straight. It was down at the time. It's about shoulder length, maybe a little longer. So I heard you like, is it to her neck, shoulder length? Um, wait, like the length? Yeah, you think it's to her shoulder, or is it past her shoulder? Um, a little past her shoulders, yeah. What color is her hair? Really dark, close to black. Y'all was at five points, you said? Last seen at five points? Yes. Okay, and what is your name? All right, we got it, so we're going to send the officer out there and see y'all come make that report, okay? Okay, thank you so much for the help. You're welcome, no problem. All right. Bye-bye. 
After getting this call, police arrive at the girl's apartment and they pretty much give them an update on everything. You know, the roommates tell them about what happened the night before, about how Samantha left without letting anybody know, about everything that has happened since then. Soon after, Greg arrives at the apartment and he was finally able to join the group and help with the investigation. He told police pretty much everything that he knew and detectives wrote all of this information down from the roommates and from Greg and then they left the apartment to go begin their search. While detectives began their search for Samantha, the roommates decided to go on Samantha's computer to see if maybe they could find something helpful on there. So they go through her email and that's when they see that she got an email from Uber letting her know that she was receiving a ride cancellation charge. Now, this was very helpful information because Samantha had told Greg that she was going to get in an Uber and then she did get into a black car. But now she's getting an email saying that her ride was canceled and that she was going to get charged for it. So what does this mean? Does this mean that the Uber driver is canceling the ride so that Uber and everyone else thinks that Samantha never got in the car? Or was the Uber driver canceling the ride because Samantha never showed up to the correct car? Now, it turns out that the Uber that she was supposed to get into was a charcoal gray 2011 Dodge Charger. And as we know, Samantha got into a black Chevy. So at this point, it definitely does seem like Samantha most likely got into the wrong Uber. I mean, not even into the wrong Uber, like just into the wrong car. Not knowing what else to do, Greg and the roommates decide to go back to Montgomery Avenue to see if they can still see if there's any clues about Samantha's whereabouts. But again, they found nothing. After this, they decide to go back to Five Points, which is where the bar was that Samantha and her friends had been to the night before. They see that there's this bar called Breakers that has a lot of cameras pointing to the street. So they decide to go see if maybe they can look at the surveillance footage to see if that could capture Samantha getting into a vehicle. However, there was no footage of Samantha. After this, they decided to go back to Bird Dog, which is the bar that Samantha was at the night she disappeared. And they asked the bar if they can go see the security cameras to see if they can find footage of Samantha leaving. Now, the roommates knew the people that worked there, so they were allowed to look at the footage, which of course was very helpful. They looked at the camera that was pointed to the street. It had very clear footage of everyone on the street. And again, this is a college bar area, so it's really busy and there were just a lot of people out. But just after 2 a.m., they can clearly see Samantha standing on the street, looking at her phone for a few minutes and then getting into a black car. It was clear that Samantha didn't get into the Uber, but into someone else's vehicle. Now, the friends had no idea whose car this was. You know, it wasn't any of their friend's car, so they took it upon themselves to go out and actually find this vehicle. They went back to Montgomery Avenue and they even knocked on the doors asking people if they knew the owner of this car or if they had seen Samantha. Meanwhile, police looked at all of the footage from all the businesses on the street and they were able to put together a timeline of what happened. So investigators realized that Samantha was supposed to walk to the right of the bar to meet her car because that's where the pickup stop was. But Instead, she walked to the left. At first, detectives can see that Samantha attempts to get into a gray car that had slowed down. She goes up to the car, but then the car just speeds off. At the same time, investigators see that a black Chevy Impala had been circling the area for 15 minutes and that they were literally just up the street from Samantha and that the driver of this black Chevy saw her attempt to get into the gray car. But when the gray car sped away, the black Chevy quickly made a U-turn and pulled up right next to Samantha and stopped in the handicapped spot. And then Samantha got into the car. Maybe Samantha just didn't realize that this was the wrong car. You know, it was two o'clock in the morning. So maybe she was just really tired and she just didn't realize that this was not an Uber. As for the driver of the black car, they probably realized that this girl was alone at two o'clock in the morning. She was trying to find a ride, trying to get into the right car. So he figured that he could just swoon in, pretend to be the Uber driver, and the girl would most likely get inside because again, it's two o'clock in the morning. She was at a bar. Maybe she had been drinking a lot and she was tired. Now in the footage, you can't really see the license plate. So detectives weren't able to search for it to see who the owner was. So instead, they just had to put out a bolo for any Chevy Impala. Now, a bolo stands for be on the lookout. So they put this bolo out and a couple of employees from a local Wendy's actually reported that they believed they saw this car at their drive through. And the reason that this car stood out to the workers was because there was a white sheet over the headrest that was covering the backseat area, which is definitely odd. 
While detectives waited to find the car, they were checking on Samantha's finances to see if there was any activity in her bank account, on her credit cards, etc. Samantha's parents actually gave investigators all of their banking information, and they saw that there were nine attempts to withdraw money for ATMs in the Columbia area. Then at 5.45 a.m., there was an attempt to take out money at a Wells Fargo ATM in Sumter, South Carolina. Then at 6.47 a.m., there was another attempt to withdraw money from a different Wells Fargo ATM. So police contacted Wells Fargo to get the surveillance footage from those ATMs, and Wells Fargo did send it over. In the footage, they saw the same man wearing a hoodie and a full face skull mask, which completely covered his identity. At this point, there were still no signs of what could have happened to Samantha. There were still searches going on for her, and you know, people were holding on to hope that she would be found alive. But unfortunately, just 14 hours after she disappeared, everyone's worst nightmare became a reality. At 4.20 p.m., police received a call from a man named Andrew Lee, who was out hunting turkey in New Zion, which was an hour and a half away from Columbia. Now, Andrew called in because he had discovered a woman's body that he said was covered in blood. Police arrived at the location to investigate at around 6 p.m. They went to go look at the body, and the body was covered in stab wounds everywhere and was completely soaked in blood from head to toe. On the ground nearby, there was blood that suggested that the body had been dragged after the stab wounds had happened. Police discovered that the victim's fingernails were broken, that her sandal platform shoes were broken and only attached at the ankle. And this woman also had only one earring in. So to investigators, it seemed like she had been killed elsewhere and just left here. Police at the scene requested a photo of Samantha and they were sent the surveillance footage from the night she disappeared. And the woman who they just found was wearing the exact same clothes that Samantha was wearing when she got into the car. So investigators bring in Samantha's parents into a conference room when they finally arrived because remember they had like an 11 hour drive ahead of them so they finally make it and the police try to have her parents id the body but her parents said that because of the state of her body they couldn't really tell for sure if it was samantha however police were telling them that they were pretty confident it was her which of course was absolutely heartbreaking for her family samantha's parents then had to call their other daughter who was back in new jersey to break the news to her samantha's dad said that it was just so hard because he could just hear his daughter on the phone scream and drop to the ground. It was especially hard for her because the sister wasn't there with the rest of the family, so she had to find this news out all by herself. The dad's retelling of the story is just absolutely heartbreaking. It'll make you cry. It'll make you feel so emotional. And I just can't even imagine what they were going through in that 11 hour drive. Just wondering, you know, is my daughter still alive? Have they found her? What is going on? It's just, it's too much. So an autopsy was done on Samantha and it was determined that she had been stabbed 120 times all over her body, mainly to her chest, to her back, arms, and to her head. She also had a defensive stab wound right through her hand. 120, that is absolutely shocking and just so upsetting. Like that is just insane overkill. The stab wounds to her head even penetrated her brain. The stab wounds were also very unique in this case. Each stab had a double the same distance apart. So the knife used was determined to be some type of double bladed knife. By the time her body was found, there was actually only 20 milliliters, which is a little more than a tablespoon of blood left in her whole body. So she had basically completely bled out. This actually made it hard for investigators to get a blood sample from Samantha that could be used for her DNA. The autopsy also revealed that Samantha was not sexually assaulted and they weren't able to find anyone's DNA under her fingernails. A detective explained that if the attacker was wearing a lot of clothes, it would make sense that Samantha wouldn't have any DNA under her fingernails. So for example, if she was trying to like scratch them and he was wearing maybe like a jacket or like a sweater, like it would be impossible for her to get the DNA under her fingernails because there was that barrier of clothes. They also determined that she would have died within 10 to 20 minutes of the attack and her cause of death was assumed to be one of the stab wounds to her head or neck but they can't really know for sure which one it was. The knife had also hit two main arteries that carry blood to the head, which in itself would have been lethal. It seems like most of Samantha's wounds were on the right side of her body, which is very common for the wounds that happen when the victim was defending themselves. The pathologist believed that the driver had started stabbing Samantha while he was still in the driver's seat, maybe after she tried to get out of the car or fight him. And she actually also tried to shield herself from the stabbing, but failed. So that night after finding Samantha's body, 
Officer Jeffrey Kraft arrived at work and said that he watched the video of Samantha getting into the car easily a hundred times before his shift even started. He said that he was determined to find that car. He knew that he needed to find that car and figure out what had happened to Samantha. So on March 30th at around 324 in the morning, he and another officer were out patrolling the Five Points area when suddenly they noticed a black Chevy Impala driving around. Now, since there was a bolo out for this car, they decided to pull the car over to ask the driver some questions. So they turn on their sirens and the car pulls over. They approach the driver's side and that's when they meet 24-year-old Nathaniel Rowland. Police ask him for his ID and he says that he didn't have any, so they told him to get out of the car because it smelled like marijuana, which Nathaniel admitted to smoking earlier. So he gets out of the car while a young woman remained seated in the passenger seat. Police tell Nathaniel that the reason they pulled him over was because his car matched the description of the car suspected of kidnapping Samantha. But before the officer even got a chance to finish that sentence, Nathaniel literally just took off running as fast as he could. There's actually a clip of the officer's body cam footage showing this, and it's actually really crazy to look at because the police officers are kind of calm just telling Nathaniel what's going on, and he literally just makes a run for it, and he actually outruns the police. But police sent out an alert to other officers to let them know that this guy was on the run. Here is that footage. I pulled your car over because it matches the suspect. Get your hand in your pocket. What are you, crazy? Get over here. Hey, get over here. Go and run. Hey, I'm going to release the dog. I can't. I was just in the Seville style. Bravo Mike wearing a gray sweatpants, gray sweatshirt. Walk him up. Doors blocked, 500 block. Nunez, keep going. He's going to be on your left. So while other officers are trying to track down Nathaniel, the other officers decide to go back to the car to investigate and see what they can find. In the driver's side storage, they found a pink keychain with a USB on it, and they also found a rose gold iPhone. And then another officer said, look at the back seat, because he had just found blood. The officer realized that this car was actually a crime scene and possibly a murder scene, so they stopped touching everything and they call in the crime scene techs to come and investigate. Meanwhile, another officer was able to find the driver, Nathaniel, and arrest him just two blocks away from where the car was parked. He wasn't really sitting up or talking, and he also claimed that he had the flu and was pretending to be asleep. So EMTs actually had to come check him out before officers would take him to the station. Once he got checked out, they all headed to the police station and they began to question Nathaniel. Now, he said that he wasn't even in the area the night Samantha disappeared and that he was at different house parties that night, but he also couldn't provide any information to prove this. He also claimed that he wasn't driving his car because he had lent it to someone else that night. So investigators really needed to get solid evidence that Nathaniel was the one driving that night since they couldn't see his face on any of the security footage. They go back to the car to see if they can find anything connecting Nathaniel to Samantha. The crime scene techs take a look and they found blood everywhere in the car as well as a large blood stain on the back seat. Footprints were also found in the car's back windows. They also noticed that the car had its childproof locks on, meaning that only the driver could control the car's windows and unlock the car doors. Also in the car, they found a handwritten checklist that said, quote, duct tape, taper hole body, gloves, all black, flip phone, gasoline, matches. Which is like, what? Like, what even does that list mean? Nathaniel's body was also forensically searched and they collected DNA from under his fingernails and other places that could be involved in an attack. But they noticed that he didn't have any cuts or scratches on his body. So detectives looked deeper into Nathaniel's background and it turns out that Nathaniel's family actually lived in New Zion, which was, again, a very small town, and their house was less than two miles away from where Samantha's body was found. Nathaniel also had a criminal record. He had a felony charge of obtaining goods under false pretenses, which is basically a charge you get when you lie to someone to make them give you product or their property. What happened in this case was that in 2018, Nathaniel and a friend were arrested and charged after they physically attacked a woman in her car and made her take them to an ATM and made her take out money and give it to them. Then they forced the victim to take them to her home and they stole her electronics. Then just hours after that, he took those items to a pawn shop and that's how they were caught. 
I don't know how he didn't get a kidnapping charge for this or an assault charge and just get more time for committing this crime. So obviously Nathaniel is not a good guy. The results come back from the DNA on Nathaniel and they discovered that Samantha's DNA was in fact found under Nathaniel's nails. The blood found in his car was also a match to Samantha's and the footprints on the car window were also confirmed to be Samantha's, which it's just so scary. The fact that there were footprints found on the windows means that maybe Samantha was trying to break the window with her foot to escape the situation. So I just can't even imagine how scared she was. Now, despite this evidence, Nathaniel claims that he was innocent and refused to say anything else. So police got a warrant for his phone records and those records placed him in the Five Points area at the exact time that Samantha went missing and also placed him in the wooded area where her body was found. The rose gold iPhone in his car was confirmed to be Samantha's iPhone and investigators got surveillance footage of Nathaniel actually trying to sell her phone at a cell phone's repair shop. And he was also wearing the same exact outfit as he was in the ATM footage, just without a mask. Now, when police were looking through Nathaniel's car, they had found an eviction notice from a woman named Maria Howard. So investigators went, they spoke to Maria, and it turns out that she was kind of dating Nathaniel. Maria said that the night of March 28th, Nathaniel was at her house and she fell asleep at around 1.30 in the morning. But she said that she woke up in the middle of the night and saw that Nathaniel was gone. She tried calling and texting him, but he just didn't answer. He was supposed to drive her to her job in the morning at 7.30 a.m. So when Nathaniel finally did come home, it was now 8 o'clock in the morning and he was still wearing the same clothes he was wearing the night before. Maria asked him, you know, where her work uniform was. And Nathaniel handed her her work uniform shirt, but it was wet. She asked Nathaniel where her work hat was and Nathaniel said, quote, it's in the country with blood on it but he wouldn't explain what he meant. So Nathaniel and Maria get in the car and Maria is the one driving, but she immediately notices a white sheet covering the backseat area. On the drive, Nathaniel is in the passenger seat and he puts on gloves and he's trying to clean the car. You know, he's wiping down the center console, just trying to clean every part of it. Maria asked him, you know, what's going on? Like, why are you trying to clean your car? But Nathaniel just told her to mind her business. Now, besides just cleaning the car, Maria also saw Nathaniel cleaning a knife. So after hearing this, police get a warrant to search Maria's home. And in the trash outside, they found a double bladed pocket knife that had blood on it, as well as clothes and paper towels with blood on them. They also found a black leather jacket that had scratches on it. Because Maria mentioned the white sheet, investigators were able to confirm that it was Nathaniel at the Wendy's drive through the next morning. Because remember, employees from a local Wendy's had called in and said that they noticed a black Chevy go through the drive through and that the driver had a white sheet in the back seat. Now, Maria fully cooperated with the police and she told them that she was afraid for her life. So I know this was a lot of information to take in. Police just had so much evidence and information to rummage through to try and put together a solid case. Now, since this knife was so unique, investigators were able to identify it as the murder weapon because it did match the stab wounds found on Samantha. Along with that, the blood from the clothes and the knife was also a match to Samantha. However, what's odd is that Nathaniel's DNA was found on the knife, but they also found another unidentified male's DNA. So with this, Nathaniel was officially charged with kidnapping, murder, and possession of a weapon during a crime. On June 9th, 2020, Nathaniel pled not guilty and he was denied bond, meaning that he would be in jail until his trial. It's just really crazy to me that he could just plead not guilty. I mean, there was just so much evidence against him. The prosecutors decided to not seek the death penalty and his trial began on July 20th, 2021. So just over two years after the murder, there were seven women and five men seated on the jury. The prosecutor's main argument was that the night of the murder, Samantha was just really tired and she accidentally got into a car that she believed was her Uber and that Nathaniel was intentionally posing as her Uber. As soon as Samantha got inside the car, he then used the child locks to stop her from getting away. 
Prosecutors speculated that it just started out as a robbery, but that for some unknown reason to them, it just escalated to murder. When it was time for the defense to speak, Nathaniel's defense attorney, Ashley, told the jury to remember the number zero. Zero represents the amount of DNA matching Nathaniel found on Samantha's body. She also said that zero represents the number of times that they will have anything bad to say about Samantha. They didn't want to say that Samantha was to blame for this, and they emphasized that this was not her fault, just like it was not Nathaniel's fault and that he isn't to blame for her death. So the defense was trying to argue that Nathaniel was innocent because his DNA wasn't found on Samantha's body and that another male's DNA was found on the murder weapon, suggesting that that person was a real killer. Now, the defense called no witnesses, but the prosecutors called many people to testify. Greg, Samantha's boyfriend, was the first witness to testify. He recounted everything that happened that night from his perspective and said how when police informed him that her body was found, he got weak in the knees and he just blacked out. Samantha's roommate also testified that she last saw her at Bird Dog and that she thought Samantha lost her phone in an Uber, so she went home and just went to sleep. Now, Samantha's real Uber driver also testified, the one that was supposed to pick her up. Well, he states that he canceled the ride after calling her several times and waiting for her at the pickup location. He also said that he willingly gave over his DNA to police on the day she went missing, you know, so he was very cooperative in the investigation. Now, the man working at the cell phone repair store also testified that he saw Nathaniel bring in Samantha's cell phone. He said that he offered Nathaniel $125 for the phone, but that he didn't take it because he wanted more. He also testified that this phone didn't register as lost or stolen. And he said because the phone was unlocked, he saw a photo that I'm assuming was like the photo of her home screen and that he confirmed that the photo on the home screen looked like Samantha. A handwriting expert also testified that it was highly probable Nathaniel wrote the list that was found in the car. Now, Maria, Nathaniel's kind of girlfriend, also testified about what she saw. You know, she told the jury in the court about her work clothes and about how she saw blood on Nathaniel's dashboard and on his seats. Maria was also shown a photo of the knife and she confirmed that she did see Nathaniel cleaning that specific knife. She also testified that she saw Nathaniel's car on the news and that's when she started to kind of put two and two together, but that she didn't call the police because she was scared for her and her child's life. The public really turned on Maria for not turning in Nathaniel. She actually received a lot of death threats and she ended up losing her job because of the death threats. The prosecution also showed Samantha's blood stain clothes to the jury. The person who performed the autopsy testified that Samantha's broken fingernails were defense wounds. On top of all of this, a cell phone location tracking expert also testified and said that Nathaniel's phone could be tracked at the time of the kidnapping to be outside of the bar. And his phone was also track to be in the area where Samantha's body was dumped. He also determined that Samantha's phone and Nathaniel's phone traveled to the same places at the same time. On July 21st, 2021, the jury took just one hour to deliberate and they found Nathaniel guilty on all charges. Samantha's mother, father, and her sister all gave impact statements at sentencing. Samantha's mom said that her daughter's death was her death. She said that she closes her eyes and she feels what Samantha endured at Nathaniel's hands 120 times. She also added that this all happened for what? You know, for $35 a college student has in their account. It's just, it's just so disappointing that Nathaniel had to commit this robbery in the first place and felt that it needed to end with murder. The mom also added that Nathaniel glaring at her family the whole trial told her everything she needed to know, that this man was pure evil. And according to witnesses, Nathaniel did show very little emotion as Samantha's relatives and her family talked about what they were going through, about all the pain that he had caused, and about how Samantha's future was just cut so short because of him. What's interesting is that Nathaniel's mother gave a statement in place of Nathaniel giving one, and she said that her son was accused of a crime that he didn't commit. So she was starting to defend Nathaniel, and that's when the judge quickly swooped in and like shut that down. He said that he wouldn't hear any claim of innocence 
innocence because Nathaniel had been convicted. She tried to say that Nathaniel is a caring person and that she knows he didn't do it, but again, the judge just quickly quickly shut that down and said that Nathaniel is guilty of murder and that he will not listen to any claim of what he did not do and also said that Nathaniel's mom is not a witness. Now, the judge addressed Nathaniel and said that he was heartless and that he had no remorse. And then he sentenced Nathaniel to life in prison without the possibility of parole. I know that won't bring Samantha back, but at least he was convicted and will spend the rest of his life behind bars. As for what happened after Samantha's murder, her graduation day came and Samantha still received a diploma, which was presented to her family. Samantha's family also started the What's My Name Foundation that tries to ensure that this will never happen to anyone again. They educate people on the four steps of SAMI, S-A-M-I, which stands for Stop, Ask, Match, Inform. So their message is to ask Uber, Lyft, Taxi, you know, any drivers, what's my name? Instead of saying, are you here for Sammy? Because then the driver can just say yes. And once you're in the car, it's already too late. So once you stop, you ask this person, you know, what's your name? And you match that the information is correct to your Uber, your Lyft, your taxi, etc. Then the next step is to inform friends and family about what's going on, you know, about the Uber driver's information, about where you're going. It's just really important for people to know these four steps. And I'm very happy that her family did start this foundation and is spreading awareness about this because it is really scary how some people just get into a stranger's car and they don't even check if it's the right person, if it's the right license plate, anything. South Carolina also passed the Samantha L. Josephson Ride Sharing Safety Act on June 5th, 2019. And it's a law that makes all rideshare drivers have to show their license plate number on the front of their car. The law also has fines of up to $500 and a jail time for up to 30 days for people who pretended to be rideshare drivers. And then they also took this law to Congress and it was passed and it's now a federal law. Other states have also passed laws that rideshare drivers must display stickers showing that they are a rideshare car and added fines and jail time for people who pretend to be rideshare drivers. I think it's super important to spread awareness on the four steps of Sammy because getting into an Uber, Lyft, or taxi is scary. You know, we're literally getting inside a stranger's car and putting so much trust into them to get us to our location safely. Anyone can literally pose as a driver because most people do just ask, are you picking up for Mike? Are you picking up for Jack? and then the fake driver can just say yeah now something that i do and it's a little bit dramatic but anytime i get into an uber i first check the license plate i check the car model and i ask the driver what's your name and who are you picking up i literally don't get inside the car until their name matches the uber app and until they confirm my name then once i get into the uber i literally call anyone my sisters my mom my fiance anyone and tell them out loud so the driver can hear me i'm in the uber i sent you the license plate number and i also shared my ride through the app that way the driver knows that people are aware of what car i'm in of who is driving me etc i literally don't care if i sound crazy to the driver i just think it's super important to be vocal about this and to keep people updated about your ride and about whose car you're in. Thankfully, there have been other features added by Uber and maybe even Lyft that allow the rider to hit a button and send a notification to emergency services that they need help, which is amazing. You can also share your ride status with anyone so they can track where you are, when you get picked up, and when you arrive. So there are some updated features by these rideshare services to ensure the safety of the rider and of the driver. So please be careful when you get into an Uber or a taxi, you know, let your friends and family know about where you're going, who's giving you a ride, etc. Samantha just did not deserve this. You know, she was so excited to go to law school and she worked so hard for this. It breaks my heart that her life was cut so short because of this man all over some money. It's ridiculous. And my thoughts and prayers go out to Samantha's family. She truly seemed like a wonderful and and sweet person. She deserved so much more and I'm happy that in a way she did get justice. But all right, you guys, that's pretty much all the information I have for today's video. Thank you guys so much for being here and for taking the time to listen to what happened to Samantha Josephson. I know it's a very intense case and it's just so scary. And like I said, I feel like a lot of people fear this and it's sad that there's so many cases similar to this. I feel like I've heard of 
this happening like very often where either someone gets into the wrong uber or like uber drivers are attacked by the riders it's just like really scary so please just stay safe out there if you guys are listening to this on youtube please make sure to leave me a comment under my youtube video or you can send me a message on instagram if there's ever any other cases that you want me to cover don't forget to follow rate, and review what happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to my channel true crime jackie on youtube for full video episodes you can also find me on instagram and on tiktok at true crime jackie bye guys